I'd like to thank all the co-sponsors of today's event, the Office of the Provost, the Student Government Assembly, the Division of Student Affairs, the GSIS uh, Graduate Student Union, the Office of Global Programs and the Office of Global Services, and of course, the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies, and especially the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and Sasha Spitalnik, who is handling all of the um, logistics. So, people who know me know that I'm usually pretty funny, but not today. Because the reason we are all gathered here is the unprovoked criminal invasion of the independent sovereign country of Ukraine by the armed forces of the Russian Federation. You've all been following the news and it's bleak. The families huddled, huddled in subway stations and basements, the bombed out apartment buildings and the besieged towns, the throngs of refugees trying to escape into Poland, Romania and elsewhere, and the dead whose true numbers we may never really know. Today's discussion is not the first event on NYU's campus about the war in Ukraine, and given how things are unfolding, it's guaranteed not to be the last. There have been vigils in solidarity with the Ukrainian people, chants of Ukrainian slogans, and performances of the Ukrainian national anthem. All of this has been important and powerful, but it's not what we're here to do today. The people invited to speak this afternoon are members of the NYU faculty who have been asked to use their expertise to help the rest of the community and people on Zoom uh, to understand some of the more perplexing aspects of the war. Before we do that, though, it's important for us as scholars to recognize publicly what we have all been lamenting in person and on social media. We got it wrong. Like so many people in Ukraine and Russia, we did not believe that this invasion was actually going to happen. We were wrong, but perhaps for the right reasons. Most of us have been exhausted by the oversimplified rhetoric used to discuss Putin and Russia in the United States. We believe that at heart, Putin was a rational actor. Yet the invasion of Ukraine is so clearly not in the interest of either country. Chances are, if you have connections with people in Ukraine, you also have connections with people in Russia. This is certainly true for so many Russians and Ukrainians themselves. So while first and foremost, we are horrified by the destruction and loss of life in Ukraine, we also watch in dismay as the Russian government stifles dissent, arrests protesters, and shuts down virtually all the remaining independent media outlets. In this barbaric attempt at the destruction of the Ukrainian state, the Russian government is turning into a caricature of itself. As we talk about this crisis, you may notice that even though the battleground is Ukraine, we keep speak, speaking an awful lot about Russia. There are two reasons, one embarrassing and the other not. The first is simply that most of us were trained as Russianists and that the American Academy has shown little interest in coursework, curricula, and hiring in Ukrainian studies. The second is that we are speaking of the causes of the war in Ukraine and it was Russia who attacked. This war is about Ukraine because Ukraine is the battlefield and Ukraine is suffering. But the causes have less to do with what Ukraine is than what some very powerful people in, in Russia think Ukraine is. Certainly various Ukrainian governments have made mistakes of their own and we could debate the wisdom of NATO expansion long into the night. But I at least firmly believe we need to look to Russia to understand why Ukraine is now bleeding. For today's discussion, I have asked each participant to pick, pick a topic and speak for no, than, no more than five minutes. Since I'm the moderator, though it turns out I got to do that twice. Uh, we can't cover everything. Instead, each of us is giving a kind of TLDR on one aspect of this crisis, leaving ample time at the end for questions from the audience, both in person and on Zoom. So when I introduce the participants, I'm going to dispense with the usual list of scholarly accomplishments and ask you to take on faith that they exist or go to our websites if you must. We begin with Arturis Rosenas, professor of politics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at NYU. Arturis will be addressing the question, did Putin misread Ukraine and why? Arturis. Uh, so I'm going to, to make a few observations about some of the assumptions behind this war and what I think was wrong with those assumptions. So it, it, I think mean, it's safe to say that by now that the war is far more costly and far more deadlier than Putin might have expected. And I, I think it's also chances are, had Putin known that this is how the events would unfold by this day, that he probably would not have invaded. So we should ask then the question, what were, what were the assumptions that he got wrong? And then of course, multiple about the reaction of uh, the United States, the action of the West. I'm going to talk about certain things he might have gotten, gotten wrong about, about Ukraine. So I think the first thing he certainly got wrong is the, the dark, horse, dark horse in this race, which is Zelensky himself. I really think that he counted on a very fast capitulation of Zelensky on the morning of 24th, and probably I would have made the same assumption, and he was wrong on that. So that is, that is easy to explain. This one is easy to explain. It's more difficult to explain why exactly Putin counted, as it is pretty much evident that he counted on the 
if not if not active, then at least passive support of the local Ukrainian population, especially in the east and maybe some central and, and southern areas of the country. So this is what I wanted to, to bring on, because I think this is a very, very perplexing aspect of the story that we need to understand better. In 10 seconds, the context here. So, right, so this is winter of 2014. Ukraine is uh, incumbent in Ukraine is uh, Yanukovych. He's closely aligned to Russia. There is a massive protest that police overreact and start shooting at protesters. Protests grow even larger. Yanukovych is removed from office. He is replaced in a clean, fair election by Petr Poroshenko. And here I'm putting the map showing the distribution, geographic distribution of support for Poroshenko. Okay, so Poroshenko is not ideological leader, right? But he gathers most of his support, he gathers in the west of the country that is considered more pro-Western, if you wish, more nationalist, whatever that term means today. And as you go more towards the east, the less, the less support Poroshenko had. And this is exactly the time when Russia sort of sieges on this narrative that Ukraine is being run by what they call Nazi junta that was imposed on, Ukraine, on poor Ukrainian people by the West, primarily the United States. Now comes 2019, and we have a new election. And who is elected is Zelensky, right? The current president of Ukraine. So I'm just, just juxtaposing these two maps to show that the support of, of, of Zelensky in Ukraine was quite the opposite, the inverse image of the support of, of, of Yanukovych. And yet, up to date, we have exactly the same narrative that this is Nazi junta, right? That these are exactly the same people. So what is interesting here, if you just look at this map, most of, so first of all, Zelensky is the most popular president Ukraine has ever had. He won this election with 75% of votes, only two percentage points less than the election of Vladimir Putin. And he did it without coercion, without manipulation, and without any fraud that Putin had to commit. So first of all, we are seeing a country uh, with an extremely popular president being attacked. That's already a very, very bad assumption. Formal, and second, we also see that most of the support that Zelensky was getting was in the East, right? Precisely in the areas where I believe and many believe Putin was counting on local support. Again, not, if not active, then at least passive support. And this did not materialize. So the question is really what, what, what exactly happened? Why? And I think there are many, many potential explanations. But I would like to circle on a particular one, and it has to do with the type of regime that Russia is. It's not right like Russia didn't care about this aspect. They, in fact, they did very careful research prior to invasion. We know now from British intelligence that there was a special FSB unit sent to Ukraine to research in a very diligent manner, to research the popular mood surround, uh, prior to the invasion. So actually, they ran surveys. We have now questions from their surveys that they ran. We have answers to those surveys. So actually, they cared a lot about it. But what happened, I believe, is that Russian intelligence is intelligence that is situated in an authoritarian state, and they don't really know how to read public opinion in a democratic state. So what did FSB learn? So they learned that many Ukrainians considered their government to be corrupt. They also learned that the approval for Zelensky has been falling. And they made what I believe is erroneous conclusion out of that, that this is actually the right ground for invasion. Whereas, in fact, if they, if they would consider these, these numbers, right, if they would consider these numbers in the context of democratic politics, they are perfectly explicable and perfectly natural, which is that most people in that part of the world, especially in Ukraine, have considered every government they ever had to be corrupt. There's nothing special here about Zelensky. If they would consider, again, these results in the context of standard democratic politics, they would understand that every incumbent starts losing support after its election. But they didn't see those numbers in that particular way, and they made the erroneous conclusion. The, the second aspect, again, which has to do with the fact that this is an authoritarian state, and I think there's nothing special here about Russia. This is we know that every authoritarian state has a problem of information flow from bottom to up. And Russia cannot be an exception. I think Russia is a very paradigmatic case of this event. So uh, what I believe happened is that a lot of bureaucrats, a lot of intelligence service people simply were reluctant to report information that would go against what they perceived to be Putin's plan. And they did not report information that would make it look like Russian forces would not be met with, with cheers and, 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 and flowers, right? So this is, really, this is really now an interesting sort of peril in which we are in, because Putin is now cornered in the war that I don't think he wanted to have. And in this case, in this particular situation, it's especially dangerous because losing this war would most certainly be, would amount to losing office for Putin. So we know from research that 50% of dictators who lose office either die 
in their office or get exiled or go to jail. So Putin probably understands these odds very well. So he's trapped in a corner. And so my observation here is that I think we talk a lot about how Putin might be sort of deranged, you know, COVID isolation. What I think is happening here, the real issue here is that we are dealing with unchecked power, unconstrained power, and the consequences of that unconstrained power. I don't think it's about personality. I think it's about politics. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Joshua Tucker. I'm a professor in the politics department and the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. I'm going to build off of what our tourist was talking about just a moment ago, who was asking sort of what happened at the state of Putin's calculation. I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about today about why it was that Putin wanted to invade Ukraine in the first place. And what I want to start by saying is we don't know, right? It is impossible to get inside Putin's head. I gave up trying to do this a long time ago. It's a fool's errand. However, we can scope out a few different possible explanations. So at a high level, I wanna focus on three potential concerns that Putin may have had. The first is security. And this is the worry about Ukraine joining NATO, to put it on the TLDR that Elliot asked for. The second is his own hold on power in Russia. And this is what I'll call the worry about Ukraine joining the EU. And the third is his legacy. Uh, which is what I will call, uh, the third is his legacy, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. First, security. Putin has been very clear about his view of security, the security arrangement in Europe in the post-Cold War era. By the story that Putin has told for many years, I think what kind of what Elliot was referring to at the beginning in the introduction, the story goes like this. Russia was weak. The West imposed a new security architecture on a weak Russia. The West took advantage of Russia because it was weak and did so by expanding the boundaries of NATO closer and closer to Russia. And that when it started to get to countries, you know, even if Russia could have swallowed the Baltic republics, which had been part of the former Soviet Union, but had basis more in the West, when NATO started to reach out to Georgia and Ukraine, that was the last straw for Putin. This is a long running narrative from Putin. And so by this story, the invasion of Ukraine is about satisfying Russian security concerns. I'm gonna go through these three potential explanations for his concerns first, and then I'm gonna talk about their implications for the on-ramp, the off-ramp, potential off-ramps. So one story here is that his concern is about the security of Russia. The second has to do with his position in Russia in terms of domestic politics, which is where my background is. And as our tourist mentioned just a moment ago, the key point here is that even though if you live in a democracy and you're used to thinking of a difference between democracies and autocracies is that dictators don't need to win elections, even autocrats need to have support of the population. And as our tourists talked about a moment ago during the Euromaidan and the revolution of dignity eight years ago, that ended with the spectacle of Ukrainians displaying peacefully the ostentious, ostentious wealth, ostentatious wealth of their leader who had fled the country walking through the palace, showing all this wealth that had been gotten corruptly. This is Putin's worst nightmare, right? Being exposed for what he has done when he has been president of Russia and being exposed in a peaceful way, something like in, along these lines. So Euromaidan was precipitated not by anything about having to do with NATO, as it turns out, but it was about Ukraine signing an agreement with the EU. And what did the EU mean for Ukraine? It meant integration into a modern European economic system. That comes with rule of law, that comes with access to Europe, it comes with eventually freedom to work in Europe and to travel in Europe. And to take us back just a little bit more to the 1990s, in the 1990s, both Ukraine and Russia had fragile, albeit very messy democracies or proto-democracy. <laughs> If you had asked, we talked, Ellie talked about getting it wrong. If you had asked political scientists in the 1990s, 22 years later or 20 years later, which country, Russia or Ukraine, would be democratic and which would be autocratic, the money would have been on Russia to be the democratic one and in Ukraine to be the autocratic one. But since Putin came to power in Russia in first 1990 and then 2000, Russia has steadily marched back towards authoritarian rule, which is now entering a much, much more repressive phase as a result of this invasion. And from this perspective, the threat from Ukraine is to Putin's hold on power in Russia, because Ukraine, as it continued to succeed as a democratic, 
West-facing country that might eventually join the European Union. That presents an alternative model for Russia. And from Putin's perspective, that's a model, I think, that after Euromaidan, he was determined to make sure was not seen as successful. So Putin, from this perspective, Putin has a goal to make sure that the Ukrainian experiment that began after 2014 would ultimately fail. The final potential explanation is what I'll call legacy or ego here, which is that Putin has also been clear that he thinks the breakup of the former Soviet Union was the worst tragedy of the 20th century. And given the tragedies in the 20th century, that's saying something. Um, and in particular, in the lead up to the war in recent times, he made the kind of strange case that Ukraine was really a part of Russia, that Ukraine was not its own independent real country, but rather had been created almost accidentally by a series of bad decisions by previous Russian leaders, in particular communists. And Putin, to be very clear, had been popular and may still be quite popular in Russia. There were a lot of things that Putin did that brought triumphs for Russia, that were triumphant for, that he could point to triumphantly for Russia. Restoring stability after the 1990s, growing the economy, making Russia strong or sort of relevant in global politics. And maybe this is what he wants to be his final Trump triumph in this regard, is the restoration of something that looks like the Soviet Union. Maybe it's a union of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, maybe more. So from this perspective, the threat is the very existence of an independent Ukraine. So what does this imply for potential offerings? If NATO is the threat, then perhaps this has the clearest implication for possible off-ramps from hostilities. You could imagine something along the line, some sort of deal that exists out there with permanent neutrality for Ukraine, agreements about restricting NATO forces in Eastern Europe, but something that provides for security. The irony, of course, is that the invasion itself has done more to invigorate NATO as a potential buffer against Russia and as a potential threat to Russia than anything that had happened in the past 30 years. If it's the EU, well then we have, in order for there to be an off-ramp for Putin, it has to be clear that continuing the war threatens his hold on power more than allowing a democratic Ukraine to continue to succeed. Although that bumps up against Artoris's point from a moment ago, that Putin, if he fails in the war, has good reason to think that that threatens his hold on power. But if we try to increase the threats from staying in the war, that points to things like sanctions. And that points to the importance of the information environment. I'm running out of time, which I will, so I, I can talk more about that during Q&A. If this is about Putin's legacy, then this is the hardest one of all to figure out how there's an offering. If Putin is determined to destroy Ukraine, an independent Ukraine, it's not clear what stops him. There are some options. The clearest one is removal from office by other Russians who think he is putting Russia on the wrong path. Others are using more for, is forced to prevent him from taking Ukraine or perhaps something that looks like a replay of Afghanistan. To be clear, these are all bad scenarios. It's just that this one may be the worst of all. Thanks. All right, so um, I'm addressing the question, why does Putin keep talking about Nazis? Um, perhaps one of the more puzzling elements in the war of words between Russia and Ukraine is Putin's persistent characterization of the regime in Kiev as run by Nazis and drug addicts too, but we don't have time for that one. <laughs> one of his demands is the complete denazification of Ukraine, which sounds like a laudable goal. At this point, I'd certainly welcome the complete denazification of the United States, but I'm not holding my breath. Still, to call the government of Ukraine Nazi when it is run by a popularly elected Jewish president and was at one point the only country in Europe to have both a Jewish president and Jewish prime minister sounds paradoxical. Of course, the election of a Jewish president does not mean anti-Semitism in Ukraine has ceased to exist any more than the election of Barack Obama solved America's anti-Black racism problem. But Putin's use of, not, of the Nazi slur turns out not to be paradoxical at all when you consider the context. In the United States and perhaps in Western Europe, when we think of Nazis, we think first and foremost of the Holocaust. If, however, you received a Soviet post-war education, that would be much further down the list. This is not only because of the lack of attention given to the mass extermination of Jews in World War II, but to the very different experience of the war itself. Much of the war was fought on Soviet territory after the German invasion. The Soviet Union lost more people in World War II than any other country on earth. In the graphic novel, Mouse, Art Spiegelman's rep representation of Germans as cats and Jews as mice makes implicit sense, 
But in the Soviet Union, the mice might well have been Soviet citizens rather than Jews before perhaps transforming into dogs to chase them out. World War II is the story of the Soviet victory over fascism and years of suffering full stop. Which brings us to Ukraine, which was occupied by the Nazis during most of the war. While Ukraine was the site of partisan resistance for the entire duration of the conflict, it also housed some very prominent collaborators. Stepan Bandera's organization of Ukrainian nationalists welcomed the Nazis and declared an independent Ukrainian state upon their arrival. The alliance was short-lived and Bandera himself would spend two years in a Nazi concentration camp before returning to Ukraine to fight both the Nazis and the Soviets. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Bandera became a heroic figure in some nationalist circles and his adoption as a symbol of a free and independent Ukraine is not only troubling, but feeds Russian claims that Ukrainian nationalism is inherently fascist. Between Bandera and the participation of the far-right paramilitary movement and political party Right Sector in the Euromaidan protest in 2014, Ukraine was not immune to critique. In the run-up to the seizure of Crimea and the invasion of Donetsk and Luhansk um, in the same year, in 2014, the Kremlin and state media portrayed every manifestation of Ukrainian nationalism and anti-Russian sentiment as a sign of growing fascism. There's nothing new about this tactic. The Russian media are borrowing from the Serbian playbook of the early 90s in the wars of Yugoslav succession, when a similar revival of Nazi-era Croatian symbols allowed Slobodan Milosevic's men to label their Croat enemies as Ustasher, World War II era fascists. In the Ukrainian case, there's some sense that somehow fascism became part of the nationalist genetic code, a dormant virus waiting to reactivate. It's a bad metaphor, but it makes more sense than imagining that the entire country was populated by Nazi sleeper agents waiting for their big break. When a befuddled Russian soldier who had participated in the 2014 invasion of the Donbass was asked by a reporter if he really believed that the Ukrainians were fascist, he paused for a while and said, well, traditionally, Russians have always fought the fascists. So for fighting them, I guess that means they're fascist. <laughs> when you call your enemy a Nazi, then every war you fight is a good war. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much to the Jordan Center, to all our sponsors for organizing this event. Um, as you see here, I have put a map that is a screenshot that's been circulating from uh, Russian television that uh, lays out one of Putin's central claims about the history of Ukraine. And that is what I'm here to speak to you about today, um, in specific about what was Soviet Ukraine. And I want to make a couple different points about the relationship between um, history and the present day invasion, the most important of which is that history is not determinative in any way. Um, in an effort to degrade Ukrainian sovereignty, as our own graduate Katie David wrote in the Washington Post, Putin has undertaken to manipulate Ukraine's history. One of his chief claims is that modern Ukraine, uh, its state and its independence, was a gift of Russia, foolishly given, which Putin now seeks to take back. Uh, we need not accept the bond that Putin proposes between history and sovereignty. And so the first point I'd like to make is to emphasize that uh, Ukraine is a sovereign state not because, it's his because of its history. Its history is not destiny. It's a sovereign state, most obviously, through the force of law. But Putin's claims have a history of their own. And it's valuable, I think, to recognize their distortions of events. Um, so... Uh, to that end, I want to provide a brief recasting of three critical moments, if you will, uh, of 20th century history uh, of Ukraine. First, its emergence as an independent state. Second, its history as a Soviet republic. And third, the dissolution of that republic uh, and the USSR and the renewal of its independence in 1991. Um, I'll focus primarily on the beginnings on the Civil War period, in part because that is the space that has occupied the most attention in this discourse of where Ukraine came from and what it is. Like so many other present day countries, including Poland, Turkey, the Baltic states, and many others, Ukraine emerged as an independent state on the ashes of 19th century empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, the Habsburg Empire. In February, 1917, the Russian Empire collapsed and this gave way to an extraordinary proliferation of political ambitions in Ukraine, in one present day Ukraine. Varieties of national and socialist political movements that combined with one another. And initially, Ukrainians of almost all political stripes sought what they referred to as autonomy 
from Russia's capital, from Petrograd. Poland, for instance, demanded immediate independence from Russia, but Ukraine sought something different. Ukraine sought what it calls autonomy. Russian political parties uh, reacted almost uniformly unfavorably to this demand, to this, to this fairly modest claim. And this had the predictable result of hardening preference among these Ukrainians of their diverse political uh, inclinations for something more than autonomy and indeed for independence from Russia. It's useful to think of the dynamics that emerged over the next few years, not as Russian uh, versus Ukrainian, but rather as oriented around different centers of political activity. Petrograd had one orbit and that orbit was transferred in March, 1918 to Moscow when the Bolsheviks moved the capital of their new Republic, their Soviet Republic uh, from one city to the other. Kiev was another center, another place of political life that attracted Ukrainian nationalists as well as Ukrainian communists. It attracted Jewish nationalists as well. It attracted indeed a great diversity of people from all across the region uh, who had been a part not only of the Russian empire but also of the Habsburg empire um, and who now were envisioning different political futures on this territory, in this space. The push for Ukrainian independence flourished. And this is true, not only of Ukraine, but indeed of many of the territories that came out, that grew out of the Russian empire and that experienced in these years between 1917 and 1924, a flourishing of independence and a flourishing of visions for their independence. While these centers of political life in Moscow, in Constantinople, which became Istanbul, in Berlin, while they were distracted, while they were distracted by their own collapse, by the First World War, which they were still fighting. And so in that moment, the push for Ukrainian independence flourished. It flourished as the Russian imperial vision and as the Russian empire was itself weak. Without wanting to, the Russian provisional government, by the end of its short existence in the summer of 1917, um, after the Bolsheviks had seized power, the, the provisional government, excuse me, lost control over Ukraine. Anarchy in Russia, that is, paved the way for Ukrainian independence. And in January, 1918, Ukraine concluded a separate peace with the Germans to get itself out of the First World War and marking the beginning of Ukrainian independence. Over the next several years, Ukraine uh, saw many different changes of government and the Bolsheviks had to fight to regain control over the territory which happened in 1920. This experience tempered expectations among the Bolsheviks in Moscow, especially uh, in Lenin, especially Lenin's own expectations for what a new framework or union between Russia and Ukraine might look like. Lenin is notably among those now blamed, he's featured in a lot of the memes you might have seen about Ukraine and its sovereignty and whether it existed. It's, Lenin, who is now blamed for giving up Ukraine. As in so many other instances, the experience of fighting for independence popularized that independence, even among those like Ukrainian peasants who may not earlier have thought of themselves in national terms. When the Soviet Union was created in 1922, as a result, it was as a federative union, rather than as the big tent Russian Soviet Republic that some, in Moscow's Bolshevik party, most notably Stalin, favored. Ukraine joined, albeit pro forma, as an independence republic. And so the point here is that, you, is that the union itself was a concession to Ukraine, whose communist leaders simply refused to join this big tent Russian uh, federation, this Russian republic. So uh, the 1920s saw a period of tolerance during which Ukrainian language and cultural production flourished. Ukraine enjoyed increased cultural autonomy from Russia in the 1930s, as is well known, and coinciding with the brutal collectivization and a famine in Ukraine that killed perhaps 4 million people. The Soviet narrative shifted, giving rise to the one that is a lot closer to what Putin advanced, which he perhaps had been taught in school, that put forward Russia's own origins as lying inside Ukraine, tracing Russian history 
as beginning with this medieval kingdom in Kiev and emphasizing the expansion of Imperial Russia as the foundation of Soviet power. The one point I wanna make here is that at the very same time as this shift in cultural policy was going on in 1920s that saw a flourishing of Ukrainian cultural autonomy that was then suppressed in the 1930s. Um, there were certain social forces <coughs> underway that coincided with or that grew out of a different <coughs> part of the Bolshevik ambition, and that was the ambition to modernize. Bolshevik modernization meant urbanization. Urbanization meant drawing new people into cities. And the composition of Ukrainian cities changed dramatically in these years, almost independent of Bolshevik cultural policy. So to give a few examples, cities are famously engines of national sentiment. And I don't have time today to get into precisely what the national sentiment was that was being created in these places. But the demographic, if you look at the demographics of Ukrainian cities in this time, they were changing dramatically. They were becoming Ukrainian in a way that they had not been previously to 1917. And you can see this if only in a statistic. All in all, the Soviet Ukrainian government published more than two and a half times the number of Ukrainian language book titles between 1923 and 1928 than had been published during the first 120 years of modern Ukrainian publishing, the period between 1798 and 1917. So this is a dramatic social process that the Soviet state will not be able to fully contain or curtail. Uh, to jump ahead to the collapse of the Soviet Union, I, I wanna emphasize simply that this too was in certain, Ukraine played a pivotal role in this moment as well. Ukraine was the most populous Republic after the Russian Federation and its referendum on December 1st, 1991, in which over 90% of participants voted to leave the Soviet Union spelled the end of that union. When Ukraine left, the Soviet Union fell apart. It had a huge economic weight inside the USSR. And as the historian Serhiy Polkhi recently argued, the Ukrainian historian Serhiy Polkhi recently demonstrated, Russia was unwilling to operate inside the terms of the union, supporting the economically weaker Central Asian republics without this counterweight of Ukraine. And so Ukraine's withdrawal brought about the fall of that historical entity uh, that we are hearing so much about today. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Next up is Anne Lounsbury, Chair of the Russian Product Studies. And please just put the arrows at the arrow down. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm going to start out by saying a few words about the Ukrainian Russian writer Nikolai Gogol who is not pictured here. Um, Gogol lived from 1809 to 1852. He was born in what was then the Russian Empire in the Poltava district of Ukraine. And his background was pretty typical of the Ukrainian gentry's cultural hybridity at that time. The family's official name was Gogol Yanovsky, with Yanovsky signaling their Polish heritage, which Gogol later denied. They generally spoke Russian at home, but sometimes Ukrainian. They corresponded in Russian, but they read in Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish. One of Gogol's most famous works, although not, I think, one of his best works, is a swashbuckling <laughs> violent tale called Taras Bulba. Taras Bulba is about Cossack life, um, with the Cossack seemingly representing some kind of or Slavic, super Orthodox spirit. And the story is problematic in many ways, not least in its anti-Semitism. So, okay, Cossacks. Behind me in the lower image is a famous painting of Cossacks from the 1880s. It's a kitschy historical tableau by the Russian artist Ilya Repin. And it's supposed to represent an event which probably never happened from the year 1676. It's the Cossacks of Zaporozhye having fun writing an extremely obscene, insulting letter to their enemy, the Turkish Sultan. <laughs> the Tsar Alexander III loved this painting and in 1891, he bought it for himself. Um, now in the upper image, you see the Ukrainian armies 
recent restaging of Repin's painting. Why? Why are Ukrainian soldiers restaging a Russian patriotic image that was beloved by a repressive Tsar? Well, these are Zaporozhian Cossacks, and Zaporozhia is now in Ukraine. In fact, it's the city where Russian forces shelled a nuclear power plant last night. So whose Cossacks are these? So I'm, this is where I wanna turn back to Gogol. In Taras Bulba, Gogol very cleverly manages to collapse together the origins of Ukrainian and Russian identity in a vaguely delineated distant past, like back in the mists of time. And he does so in part through the symbolic mediation of Cossacks. And we can actually watch him doing it because he wrote two versions of Taras Bulba, one in 1835 and one in 1842. And he, we can see him sort of tweaking the ideological resonance of the symbols that he uses. Now, in historical reality, Cossack society had its roots not in the loyal service to any state, but in the desire to escape from all state power and live independently. Eventually, in order to secure some version of this independence, the Cossacks entered into military service of the Russian Empire but they were never completely under the state's control. They often rebelled. They often caused big problems. Now, the image of the Cossack is claimed by both Ukrainians and Russians. Because of their long intertwined history, Ukrainians and Russians are often drawing on the same reserve of cultural symbols, not just Cossacks, but things ranging from Orthodox iconography to World War II battlefield insignias. This kind of overlapping and hybridity is part of what's most fascinating, most complicated about both countries. These images are rarely neutral. In fact, the iconography that's being deployed in today's war is often ideologically dicey. It's dicey enough that I myself refrain from sharing certain symbols that I find online um, because I don't understand their resonance well enough to be clear about the signals that I might be sending. So that's why I'm going to close my remarks um, with a picture of Ukrainian soldier and pop star Andrei uh, Hlivnyuk singing a patriotic song in Kiev while wearing a New York Yankees hat. I'm not a Yankees fan, but I can get behind that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Next up, we have Natalia Rivana, Professor of Information Systems at Stern, on the question, what is happening right now with regular citizens in Ukraine? Thanks, Elliot. So today I'll be speaking with you, unlike my colleagues, not at all in any professional capacity. I do not study Ukraine. I do not study Russian history. I just happen to be from the city of Kharkiv, that many of you now know about. I'm a professor of technology and innovation, and I'm speaking <coughs> here because I felt that I could speak from what I know from the ground. Uh, many of my students, uh, when I start introducing myself in my classes, don't know where you, didn't know where Ukraine was on the map. So I would often start saying, here I am, and by the way, I'm from Ukraine, and here is Ukraine on the map. And unfortunately, I don't need to do this anymore. And I, I wish I did. When I introduced myself to my students, nobody knew where Kharkiv was either. Or what that city is like. Um, I was born and raised in Kharkiv. It's an education center of Ukraine. It's responsible for many advances in science over the last hundred years. Uh, and talk just reminded me that Ilya Repin, the person who painted the famous painting, was from Kharkiv region. I remember going to a museum and seeing his paintings as a local painter. Um, and the thing is, but most importantly, it's a city of two million people. Just to give you a sense from cities you know, it's a little bigger than Philadelphia. It's about a little bit bigger than Phoenix, Arizona, and a little bit smaller than Houston, Texas. It's a big city, has many people, uh, people, uh, education, culture. And just because you now see 
the city in the news after the barbarian attack. Just wanted to show you a few seconds almost of what it was like before. So this is like some of the squares of Kharkiv, some of the like center of the city, some of the domes. Um, this like some of the, this is a famous big opera, it's a huge opera. Uh, and now this is the city you see today on CNN and NBC. And the thing that's striking to many of us that the bombs are bombing the historic center as well as the other places. The, num the, the bombs that you see fall on the university square where I have more memories that I can remember. They fall you know, on the streets where my mom worked. Um, they fall in places that have nothing to do with military defenses of Ukraine. And the last thing like you might have seen is this on news is this is the main square of Kharkov. Uh, and this is where the bomb fell in the middle of the day. And the subway stations you see is the big one is right under the square. So people are hiding right under there. That's the subway I took to get to the university on a daily basis. So I want to tell you a little bit uh, more about this. Uh, in particular, given the atrocities that we now see happening in Ukraine and in a city like Kharkov that, that Putin seems to have a particular grudge with, um, and I can let my colleagues explain why it's explainable. You know, I wonder why have not more people, especially women and children, left the city? And I remember growing up as a child in Kharkiv and wondering why have so many people stayed behind in Kharkiv when, you knew, when they knew during World War II that Nazis were coming, and including Jewish people, who by that time when the Kharkiv was occupied already might have heard what, what Nazis are doing with civilian population, especially with Jews. And to me growing up, it was always like a, a puzzle. Why didn't they just leave? And I now know unfortunately why. I have three elderly aunts living in Kharkiv. My aunts are average age 80, like some are slightly older, some are slightly younger. They also have cousins like the sons of, of the sons. My aunts are simply too frail to travel. Okay, sorry about that. We're not quite sure why that happened. Um, so thank you so much, Natalia. Um, now we have Rosen Diagolov, Assistant Professor of Russian and Slavic Studies asking, what do ordinary Russians really think about the war? Uh, Rosen? Thank you, Elliot. I'm, I'm afraid I'll be concluding our teaching on a rather late down note, especially after Natalia's testimony. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, another group of victims in this war, who are certainly not the main victims, so it is one thing to have bombs falling uh, in the city. And it is entirely different to be morally or economically squeezed, even fired or arrested with some, some Russians. Been, um, especially those who protested. But I'm really going to be uh, presumptuous uh, and tight to what, what Russians think about the war. Um, and of course, of course, we all hope that uh, this group of victims will become agents and will bring down the, the regime that is persecuting this war. The people I know personally in Russia uh, tend to be Muscovites, uh, highly politicized and educated. Uh, and with the exception of uh, two or three very distant Facebook friends, uh, tend to be unanimously opposed to the war. Many have gone out to protests uh, and been arrested and published anti-war calls, activities which, after the passage of yesterday's so, uh, Yesterday's laws risk 15 years of imprisonment. Uh, even a signature in an anti war petition uh, you know, just, um, can easily result in a dismissal from your university, museum, or other state employment. 
uh, opposition media cannot operate under these circumstances, and uh, opposition media cannot uh, media channels, mostly online uh, these days, cannot operate under these circumstances, and have been uh, closing at um, rapid speed in the last two or, th two or three days. So some of my friends have left the country to continue their political activities, which will no longer be possible if they stayed in Russia. Uh, but it is important not to take uh, my friends or our friends as in any way representatives and uh, of the wider Russian population. And um, already a first set of opinion polls uh, has uh, started appearing. And these are and these posts came yesterday by uh, Tsiom uh, and Russian Field, both uh, in different ways state-related uh, opinion polling agencies. Uh, and these were questions about the special operation, of course, you know, not, not the war. And the results are not particularly encouraging. You know, for Tsiom, the approval rate of the special operation is 63.5%. Uh, for Russian field 59. Um, but I would be personally quite skeptical of these numbers. We do not know what, what they stand for. I think <laughs> the majority of those who said yes may support destruction of military objects or denazification, whatever that means, uh, but not so much the war that is actually happening. Uh, but moreover, uh, less than a quarter of those approached provided answers. How representative is that quarter of, of those uh, who were asked and of the whole Russian population? Would you like to provide uh, answers that would have exposed you as a disloyal subject by furnishing a negative answer? Indeed, there's a long tradition to which I fully subscribe of critiquing Russian and not only Russian opinion polls for serving not so much to reflect public opinion as to actively shape it and achieve uh, the aligning of popular sentiment with the state agenda. Uh, and unfortunately, that's something that not only uh, state-aligned uh, public opinion polls, uh, the vast majority of them, but even the independent Levada Center is known for. Um, but this, uh, this may be in the FTSIOM data uh, survey for the data, which, which may be more informative, if probably somewhat predictable, namely the very strong correlation of support for, for the special operation with age and source of media. The older the respondents are, the more likely they are to support the, uh, the special operation. An even stronger correlation comes from the, the source of media. If, if it is television, uh, the likelihood increases vastly. But, uh, you know, I find actually much more uh, informative the, <coughs> the, date, the qualitative data uh, provided by sociologist data, James Morris, who conducted a, a very large number of uh, rapid informal interviews with supporters um, of uh, the special operation. Um, and who identified two strands in their, uh, in their responses. Uh, one, uh, disbelief and denial, uh, and another one, uh, different uh, coping mechanisms of cognitive dissonance uh, <coughs> and revolving around wishful magical thinking. So there is really uh, very little coherence to the responses they provided which is partly a function of the uh, official <coughs> me media, which is only beginning to, to consolidate its narrative after a very sudden start. Because until the day of the invasion, uh, Russian officials were ridiculing the prospect of war. Morris describes the process taking place right now as defensive consolidation rather than a more active rallying around the flag. And indeed, uh, we are really at a very different point from 2014, which most Russians uh, celebrated as a Russian spring. And, uh, and really, that was a moment that generated um, you know, what, what we know as the Crimean consensus. Uh, the, even among supporters, um, supporters 
um, of the of this war. You know, again, a tiny. Uh, I I believe not a not a big group. The the mood is grim and uh, confusing. Thank you. Thank you, Rosen, and thank you everybody for putting up with our uh, technical difficulties. So now at this point, we're going to start the question and answer. And so we'll take questions. I ask um, the panelists to come, come up here, please. Um, so we will take questions both in person and on Zoom. Yeah. Um, Professor Rosenas, I know you talked about um, authoritarianism in Russia, and I know something you touched on on the larger questions, but how do you think the authoritarianism, Putin's authoritarianism is going to impact the way this war ends? So how is this question, how is the authoritarianism going to impact the way the war ends? I'm not sure how much this could work. As I sort of mentioned, in the worst possible way, because the end of this war is tied with the political fate of Putin, and the political fate of Putin is tied with his personal fate. And that connection is much stronger in authoritarianism, so that that's not at all good news for the end of this war. That's, in fact, one of the worst news for the end of this war. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, anyone can answer this question, but it's more on the policy side of things. So what are the future policy options for Zelensky and Ukraine, given the fact that NATO is reluctant to act at this moment? Could, could you say that again? Future policy options for Zelensky and Ukraine at the moment. What are the options for Zelensky and Ukraine at the moment? Yeah. So they don't care to address that? Are you asking about NATO options at this point? No, no, Ukraine options at the moment. I, I so mean, by, yes, the only option. I mean, I think I agree with Artaris. Uh, I think the, I mean, at this point, uh, Ukraine is fighting and it's fighting in a way that was, as Artaris noted, was, you know, very much unanticipated by the people who made the decision to invade uh, in Russia. I think right now Ukrainians are, are, are sort of, uh, fighting a multi-pronged uh, attempt at survival here. One involves the military and supporting the military within the country, which is, as we're describing, involves a lot of people volunteering to join right now. It involves the population arming themselves for resistance uh, in this, in the, in, you know, in the event of occupation. There is also a kind of information battle that's going on that I think people have been surprised by how well the Ukrainians have done in that battle as well, in kind of dispelling the myths that were spun before the before the invasion, which were essentially, as has been said by multiple panelists, that you know the country was run by by Nazis and by drug addicts, and that they were incredibly unpopular, and that the Russians would be welcomed as liberators. Uh, that um, that was a story that the Russians were trying to tell as part of the invasion, both to their own population but to the rest of the world. Um, and I think there has been a, you know, Zelensky with his, you know, his line of I want ammunition, not a ride, you know, the kind of memes that's emerged out of that. There has been a kind of a clear attempt to communicate what is actually happening on the ground to dispel any of this myth that this was a very, you know, the Ukrainians were laying down their arms and those kinds of things. And I think that continues to be a, that will continue to be a uh, that will continue to be something that Ukraine tries to do is control the narrative, both to try to keep the West uh, united and the people who put the sanctions in place united, uh, but also to deal with the fog of war and in the battlefield. I think we'll see increasing sort of disinformation campaigns around Zelensky has fled or this city has fallen. And so you'll continue to see this kind of active attempt to control, to get correct information into the information environment. And I think Ukrainians are also, Ukraine is also trying very much um, to pressure the rest of the world to do more. Uh, along a, a, a wide variety, uh, a wide variety of dimensions. So I think those would be the sort of three things I think the Ukrainians are doing. With the first one, you know, being by far the most important. Okay, the, I'd like to combine two questions from the chat, seem rather related to each other. Um, one possibly optimistic and one scary. Um, what is the role of the UN in this difficult time, and what kind of impact can they provide? And how likely does the panel see that the situation could escalate into a World War III using nuclear weapons? <laughs> No pressure. Okay. So as far as UN goes, it's not really a 
organization to set up to intervene in a conflict that is happening at this particular level. So you might sort of think when things come down, maybe there is some space for UN to actually do something, you know, with peacekeeping troops, whatever that would be. But I think it's no, we are nowhere near that particular eventuality. I do not know what to say about the odds of the Third World War with the nukes, to be honest. I, I, I don't know how to even approach that question, to be honest. The probability is bigger now than it was 10 days ago. Let's put it like this. Aside of that, I really don't know what to say. Uh, on, the, on the UN part of it, I think it has played a role so far in signaling the limited resolve of support there is internationally for Russia. There, have been, there was a vote taken in the General Assembly, and Russia had the, the support of Syria, Belarus, Eritrea, and North Korea. Um, and there's a bit of you know, uh, speculation as people watch kind of what China does, and there's a big question about how China is going to behave throughout this um, situation. And so watching China take votes in the UN so far, you know, there's been... There's a lot of different stories about what China's doing. We can talk more about that if people are interested, but the UN is one way... Uh, that that's been able to be to be signaled uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of I, 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 like Arturis, I have no idea. I have no idea what the situation is. I completely concur with his statement that it's greater than it was 10 days ago. Um, I think, though, to put a bit more concretely, when we think about escalation, uh, for, if any of you read Putin's book, Gervo Lizzo, or first person, is a story about the rat, the rat being cornered, and then how the rat, they used to chase a rat, and then the rat, you know, got cornered and came back. And every journalist is now discovering this and asking if Putin is now the cornered rat. Um, and so if you think about when people talk about escalation in this situation, you know, there's, there's sort of, I can think of sort of, there's sort of, I would say four ways that this could be escalated. One way is to intensify the violence against the people of Ukraine. And that is unfortunately already happening as we've just seen in those pictures. Um, but as we're learning very quickly, that can always get worse. Um, the second is to escalate by spreading the conflict out of just Ukraine. Um, and there in particular, there are, you know, there are scenarios that people spin out where there might be a, you know, an attempt to, if, if everything is going badly in Ukraine, it might be an attempt to expand outside of Ukraine. The third way would be with a kind of devastating cyber attack. And there's all sorts of questions about what sort of assets the Russians have in place in Western infrastructure and what sort of assets the West has in place in, 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 in Russian infrastructure. But that would be something like, you know, an attack on the energy grid you know, or something along those lines or trying to shut down banking system temporarily or something like that. And the third is to escalate, you know, the type of, you know, the physical weapons, which is the fourth is would be, you know, to, to use nuclear weapons. I don't, I, I mean, again, you know, there is a reason that deterrence lasted for so long during the entire Cold War. Um, and, you know, there are known consequences of this, but as we, one of the things that people worry about is sort of incremental escalation um, and so, you know, is, is the possibility, you know, it is, it, let's put it this way. It's certainly in, in Putin's interest for the West to think that he might, you know, unleash a tactical nuclear weapon at some point. Um, uh, and, and that's a very dangerous, dangerous situation. Um. It's my understanding that there's, has been, or is a certain degree of pro russian sentiment in parts of Ukraine um, has this sentiment changed at all in the past few days? And if it's regardless of whether it has or hasn't, does it have any impact on the war as it's ongoing? I, mean, I don't think we had any data, especially from the, from the zones where, where the, 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 the you know, most hard battles are going on. But my sense of the following, wherever the public opinion towards Russia was on the evening of February 23rd, shifted massively by the morning of 24th, I do not know. I, I would guess that not much has changed in, since that perturbation to the previous public opinion. But if anything, I would say that hostility might, towards Russia might have increased since then. And I can, on the basis, <laughs> the anecdotal basis of a couple of friends of mine based in, uh, in Russia with, with pro, pro Russian Ukrainian relatives uh, living in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, for about most cases to be uh, in, in cities with about people, and, uh, the, these formerly pro-Russian 
production relatives are no longer supporting the power that is about to attack the cities. Yeah, we had another event at the. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say again from a very small sample size, what I see, like, again, from friends, parents, and so on, it seems to have shifted, but not fully. We still know today. Somebody in Kharkov still supporting Putin, even though this person stayed in his like his house and like a bomb can fall. But also quite a few who like when it all started were like they're gonna come quickly and like save and now they're bombing our children with them. So still there are some who I guess I'm guessing from uh, basically watching Russian news. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, we had another event this morning in the Jordan Center, and we had uh, someone uh, on, the, on the panel who had been living in eastern mm -hmm. Ukraine for the last five years and family relatives. And his take, so this is secondhand on this, but germane to your question, was that there were a few towns close to the border where the Russians came in and met little resistance and the people seemed okay with it. But, but then, again not nearly as many as people would have expected. And once you got out of these kind of few towns, there seemed to be, you know, there, these are people, you know, people in the streets, getting into the streets to scream at tanks in Russian to go home and stuff like that. So I think, you know, again, it's early days and it's fog of war, um, but I think Arturis's point that there was probably a pretty big shift in this. Yeah. This is the story we're getting from multiple Multiple so one indication, just to add to that, like when, when you know, when Zelensky called mobilization, right, you had these pictures of people lining up to sign up uh, to serve in the resistance. And uh, there were many pictures from the east of Ukraine where the lines were very long. So yeah. it's, it's not yeah. really confined. To the just center. from my story, right? yeah. I, Kharkov is 90% of population is Russian speaking. And the mayor right now is Russian, Russian. Like, so he speaks in Russian to to the people that I've seen him shortly, and people are signing up in Kharkiv, right? All my cousins, every single one of them is like that they are able physically. So definitely the like, Russian population. I mean, like when, when your mom's home is bombed from the plane, like you stop making those distinctions and they never actually did in the last many years. The other thing I was gonna add is some people who were really unhappy with Ukraine, and we're very pro-Russian, left in the last eight, so from 2014. So like there is like the, the first point of decision of which side you're on for many people was 2014, the Crimea and the Donbass, not right now. Right now, like who stayed fewer, let's say, and certainly after February 24th, very, very few would actually be welcoming him with like bread and salt, as we say. Yeah. Uh, how important has the uh, like leadership and sort of mantra that Zelensky has adopted with um, not wanting a ride? I, like I need ammunition. How 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 important has like his his uh, his response been to the resistance? And how how would Ukrainians have had such significant resistance to to the invasion if if that if Zelensky hadn't really uh, rised up to the moment and sort of like to charge like that is how, how important is that then? Isn't it a philosophical question? Was we would know like what happens? I'm sorry, but my sense is with the whole world is now admiring his courage, right? And many people who didn't didn't like him within Ukraine have now switched sides. So I look from what I understand, my, my relatives. Like from that survey that you're talking about in the democracy, they would have been voting as like not approving Zelensky before the war. <laughs> and now they're, they're fighting. But I, I personally, philosophically, don't think it's possible to tell. Like Poroshenko could have like behaved and like, uh, who knows, right? But it's clear that he's behaving in a way that makes people want to stand up and defend the country. But I think the aspect that it wasn't really expect, expected that it's going to be so strong, right? Yeah. I think that that took many by surprise in both, you know, negative ways. I'm sure Russia took it negative, and I'm sure whatever sort of latent resistance was there took it as a very positive sign. So part of it is, you know, Ukraine is not highly centralized country, and I'm pretty sure even without, you know, central leadership, say, you know, Zelensky would have been killed or capitulated very early, we would still see a lot of resistance, mm -hmm. except that 
it wouldn't be so well organized, it wouldn't be so well motivated, right? And it wouldn't believe in its victory to the degree that it does now. So I think unexpected factor of it was very important. I think, I mean, things changed in terms of, this is Arturis' line from, I'm sorry, but Saturday night was when things changed in terms of the Western response where they, you know, there were the pro forma sanctions originally, and then there were some, and then, and then it started going into territory that no one really expected. And so the question is like, what got us to Saturday night and that kind of decision-making that suddenly got made, if you think that that's consequential, then what got us there? And I would say in that case, you know, the major thing is what happened on the battlefield, right? That Eve wasn't taken, but the emergence of Zelensky as a figure and, and he spoke to the European Parliament at part of this time as well, like that, that it kind of, the West, I think when we look back on this, we will think that the West resolve stiffened when they thought that this wasn't going to be over in three days, right? And that, that allowed the coalition to come together a little better. And I, will, and I would say Zelensky played a role in that, in, in that kind of, as a focal point, as something for people to, to something for that that would be my guess that that was that was important in that regard that had there been no government to look at at that point it might have been harder to go ahead and put put these coalitions together and put these stronger sanctions in place but that's only speculation just one comparison right so when you think about august right of last year and withdrawal from afghanistan what was the bottom line what was the bottom line that people were complaining is that you know Afghan forces are not fighting for their country. And it also sort of seemed like, okay, what else can we do if not, they're not fighting? So I think this sort of juxtaposition of what happened in Afghanistan and what happened in Ukraine, right, in this sort of military standoff and re- existence of resistance, I think that that was also an interesting contrast that, that probably also motivated some Western leaders to react in the way they did. Okay, I'm going to combine three questions from the chat that are all kind of related. Um, does public opinion in Russia matter now for the outcome is is there a possible a positive probability for the event where putin would retract with um with or without concessions given sanctions affecting the economy and then also given that people are talking about putin, calling putin a war criminal what kind of off-ramp is there for someone who's being declared a war criminal by people around the world so basically what do you think is going to happen <laughs> I mean, the significance of public opinion is uh, really a very difficult, very important question because mechanism is that public opinion uh, becoming policy uh, is entirely, entirely unclear uh, or absent. Um, and that's, these are really massive demonstrations, which uh, would, of course, really. Um, involve massive risk for uh, everybody involved. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, but the opinion of certain sections of uh, the population you know, Consequences in ways that we do not fully imagine. Um, yeah. uh, since it's since it's a teaching, um, I'll, if there are any of you who took intro comparative politics with me, I'm going to reference Timur Karan's book, right? Timur Karan's article now out of never. I mean, the weird thing about public opinion in autocracies is that, as Arturis was saying before, it's hard to know. Uh, when people are turning against the leader because there are incentives to not broadcast that public. And I would recommend, in the spirit of a teaching, anyone go check out, check out that article, Now Out of Never by Timur Karan. It's about what happened during the collapse of communism, but it has a very kind of interesting model in it about how small changes in public opinion can actually lead to huge sways in who's willing to come out. And, and, and I think history is respite with examples of autocrats who had the support of everyone in the population until they didn't. Um, but more than that, I think I'm gonna, I would fall back on the, on the point I made earlier, which is that even autocrats need supporters. You can be the most powerful autocrat in the world. If everyone else in the country hates you, you're not gonna stay in power indefinitely, right? And the way that we would think about it as political scientists is to think about support among elites and support among the masses. And those two things can kind of compensate for each other. 
But I think when you look at it in, the, in light of the question that came from the, from the Zoom room, this is the idea behind the sanctions. The sanctions are trying to make it more costly for Russians for this war to continue, more costly both for elites who are losing a ton of money, but also more costly for masses in Russia who are going to have to deal with severe economic dislocation uh, in the medium term. And, and, and it started, you know, it started already. I'll leave it to someone else to talk about the offering. Just to elaborate very briefly on the public opinion. So let's not be romantic here. And let's not think that massive revolution now will happen in Russia and the people's power is going to overthrow the, the Kremlin. That is probably not going to happen. But that doesn't mean that these protests of any size are not important. So what, one thing that we know from research about, again, is because it's teaching, is that most autocrats who are removed from office, they are removed not by revolutions, but they are removed by regime insiders to good at us. But this is another thing that we also know that a lot of times the public uprising, a revolution, a large scale protest also serves as a very enticing opportunity for those coup d'etats to, to happen. So a lot of coup d'etats happen actually after some, some form of popular uprising. So the way we should think about it, and again, it's not that you know Russians are going to uprise and they're just going to storm the Kremlin. Probably that's not going to happen. Nonetheless, it might be very important for the incentives of people around, around Putin to actually commit coup d'etat, which I think is the only way out of it. If you talk about off-ramps, I think that's the only off-ramp. Yeah. So, as uh, Professor Bernstein uh, described, we've been hearing a lot of Russian propaganda outlets and Russian state media talk about how Ukraine is run by Nazis. That's like their reason for invading it. They often point to groups such as White Sector or Azov Battalion uh, to sort of prove this claim of theirs. Of course, these groups are real and they are a problem, but in no way does their existence justify the invasion of the entire country. Um, that being said, if the worst case scenario were to happen and Ukraine was to fall, if Kiev was to fall, and Russia had to fight an insurgency group, historically speaking, those groups have always been led by these extremely fundamentalist nationalist groups, uh, specifically referring to events such as the Mujahideen eventually. Um, is there a real possible possibility that there could be like a Ukraine? <laughs> oh, um, sh sure, but I don't think there needs to be. I, um, that is, th it is always possible, as you were suggesting, that if things get bad, people get more and more extremists. But um, they probably don't need to go that far in the direction of extreme nationalism to rally people who um, feel that their land has been taken away from them. What I, what I would imagine happening um, is an extended insurgency that is going to be very hard on Russia and terrorism brought into Russia proper. Um, and you can have that without people being um, hardcore um, fascist or anything like that. But that, I think, is, is, is the big risk if, if Russia wins. Yeah. Um, is there a way in which that you can impose sanctions on Russia that will achieve the West's goals without hurting Russian civilians as possible? Just as an anecdote, um, one of my mom's close friends lives in Moscow. She's Russian. And she's worried now that she's not going to be able to afford her chemo treatment for her husband. And her son now is not going to be able to attend the British school that she wants to attend. There is mostly like an economic issue. And you can, I guess, yeah, just impose sanctions that aren't going to destroy the lives of so many innocent Russian civilians. So that became kind of, this. that's called targeting sanctions. And that's the whole point of it is to try to surgically and, and I think sanctions have gone through a kind of period of evolution. And whereas original sanctions were sort of very broad based, like right? we're going to shut down this sector, we're going to not allow anyone to trade, you know. And then I think that for a while, these sort of targeted sanctions were much more in vogue. And that's what the State Department was trying to do after uh, the annexation of Crimea in 2014 was exactly that was what they were trying to do for exactly this reason. Not to not to harm innocent, uh, not to harm people. Uh, that is not what's happening. You know, that is uh, right now. There are attempts being made to make it. You know, 
the, the West had essentially, in one way, by announcing that they were not going to engage in any armed conflict as long as the conflict remained within Ukraine, you know, limited the number of things that they could do in a situation like we find ourselves in now with sort of devastating violence and, and, and a country, you know, as we talked here about a, country, a large country threatening to try to destroy a smaller country next to it. And so I think at this point, uh, things like what we have seen implied, like seizing the asset, not seizing, but like freezing the assets of the central bank and things along these lines, these are things that are going to, um, that are going to hit broad base. And that, and it goes back to this question of, you know, how do you bring pressure to bear on a regime to change course? And, 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 and again, we don't, as Artur said, we don't know if that, you know, that pressure may be about convincing elites that they would be much better off. And those elites may feel more emboldened to act if they feel the mass population is more, is, you know, wants the situation to change uh, in this particular way. But I think, you know, I think that's the, that's, I don't know, someone else want to add more on it, but that, I mean, I think that's, yes, it is possible to do that, but no, that's not what's happening now. I will say what also is happening now is that companies are just getting out of Russia and shutting down. And those are not like, those are not wanting to deal with sanctions. Those are not wanting to be on the wrong side of things, but those are also not wanting to be a part of Russia. Like there are not sanctions right now in the oil industry and BP just pulled out, right? Like, and you, and this is going to be an issue as well, because um, that just means a lot of jobs are disappearing. Like that's not even the sanctions. That may just be a reaction to the, I mean, it is a reaction to the sanctions, but it's not even a direct effect of the sanctions, but that's going to hit, that's going to hit people as well. Should I, can I have a quick response to this? I mean, when we think about the fact that somebody is not going to get cancer treatment, we really feel sorry for this person. But I wonder if, like, so today, like, Anne has shared a story, and I heard it now three times or more from different, like, people talking to their mom in Ukraine, in Moscow, talking to an uncle in St. Petersburg. And when these are people living in Kharkiv or Kiev under the bomb attacks, and they're saying, this is what's happening, I'm in a bomb shelter, and this relative of theirs tells them, don't sell me Ukrainian propaganda, this is not happening. So I'm wondering, and perhaps my, you know, I hope your mom's friend is like a liberal person, but has she talked to people at her job? Because maybe people cannot go to the streets, but maybe they can talk to each other. Because my understanding is from, again, your academic friends in Russian circles, I'm not part of it, is that like a good number of people were not confronted with this BBC and other news and not like you can get any news. There are channels where you can get normal news. They say it's not happening, like it's all Ukrainians bombing their own cities and their own town squares. So maybe they should do something like to, to try to educate each other, because I think people say this kind of ignorance, of course, propaganda is like just say not smart enough. I don't believe that. I think that it's convenient not to learn this. And it's like self-preservation and all types of like cognitive dissonance like removed. They at some point need to say to their friend, not to like the city square, this is what's happening. And while I feel the pain of this woman who can't afford cancer treatments, they should start talking at least to each other and watching something other than Russian news propaganda. Yes, and the, but it also has to be said, and this is something I mentioned, it allows probably the main economic casualties of the sanctions. Uh, okay, not to me, but but among labor migrants from Central Asia, uh, of whom there are several millions in Russian cities uh, who are you know, feeding their families in Pakistan and uh, Now that the ruble has crashed and now that uh, they cannot send money actually out of Russia, uh, you know, the, these economies which are so heavily reliant on remittances are going, you know, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan um, are going to suffer immensely sanctions. So I'd like to combine two more questions from, uh, from the chat um, about the military. Um, one is that Ukraine has shown videos of um, Russian, captured Russian soldiers saying they were basically tricked into coming to serve in Ukraine. 
and the other is to what extent is low morale within the Russian army causing the apparent lack of progress so far? Is the reluctance of conscripts a, a significant factor or wishful hyperbolic reporting by the West? So I think it's very difficult to make a lot of conclusions from, from those videos. We do not really know how uh, the real extent of that problem. There is a lot of, I presume there's a lot of selective reporting on the part of uh, you know Ukrainian social media. They are fighting the war right now. For them, that's that's the main thing. And there are certain facts that they want to present, certain facts they do not want to present. But the assumption that large parts of you know, troops in the Russian army are not well motivated makes total sense, given the nature of this war, and generally given how soldiers in the Russian army are motivated. They were initially very unmotivated even during the Second World War. It took a while. It took a lot of coercion for the for Stalin to actually mobilize and, and incentivize and entice its troops, its troops to fight, even in a defensive war. And here we have an offensive war for reasons that are very hard to understand. So just based on that, the assumption that Russian troops are not well motivated, I think, makes a lot of sense, even given sort of the selective reporting aspect of it that we see on social media. Can I just make a comment? Sure. Okay. I'm a faculty at NYU, and for those who don't know me, I'm a war veteran, but not from many wars in America. The story has it that the one who is creating the war and is offensive is in 10 times worse position than the people who are defending themselves. Number one, they don't know the territory that well, no matter how much you study it, you don't know who is hiding, who is in front of you, who is behind you, and all that. So all those ingredients, putting it together, they make the, offense, the offensive people, putting them in 10 times worse situation than the ones who defend themselves. The other issue that worries me is that there's going to be a lot of bloodshed, and the war will escalate. And the war will escalate because Russians will use heavier weapons, it's my judgment. And that really is a scary situation. It's not like 50, 100 years ago that the wars were happening with just a gun. And whoever had the stamina and as they are reserved in those who are fighting, the hero is the one who lasts five minutes longer. Here is not a matter of getting a gun or getting a Molotov. And what I'm afraid is going to be more heavy bombardment. Thank you. Um, question back here. Yeah, Thank so you. I remember during your, your discussion of like the history of Ukraine, you were talking a lot about how, um, how Ukraine was important for like the preservation of the USSR. Um, I was wondering how that plays into their strategy right now. And then there's been a lot of discussion about expansionism. So I was wondering uh, how the whole panel feels about like what potentially that would even look like. You, you can answer Ukraine's economic significance to the- Yeah, economy. so I was wondering like how that would be impacting like currently or why- well, I can leave it to my colleagues to speak more about the contemporary state of the Ukrainian economy and its potential contribution to uh, the Russian economy. But the historical dynamics were that Ukraine was simply the most industrialized and most advanced, among the most advanced territories that Petersburg had control over and that Moscow had control over. And one of the things that was most remarkable, for instance, if you look at the history of the Second World War, is that the Soviet Union had to essentially, you know, how to put it, the, the Soviet performance in the Second World War is all the more remarkable given how much of Ukraine it lost. I would put it that way because it had to find ways to build tanks to, my sense is that those dynamics have, you know, been transformed yeah. by the end of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, it's of course difficult to, to talk about culture uh, now, but since many of us are involved in culture in some way, I, I just wanted to ask, um, thinking about the the identity questions between uh, Ukraine and Russia, which 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 some of you have, have raised, um, how do you see that playing out? Uh, you know, 
will there be debates about Gogol that will change? Will there be debates about orthodoxy? Is, is the symbolism of Kiev's history um, going to come into play? Is it at play now in, in, in the media in those countries? I, I would, yeah, I would say one thing I've noticed that I think is, I, I wouldn't say worrying, but um, you know, this is a space that has historically been erased from having its own narratives in different ways. I think there's a real danger at the present moment of perpetuating that erasure by insisting that uh, Ukraine must demonstrate its adherence to idealized principles of liberalism in order to enjoy sovereign status. Um, so I would hope that we could resist that sort of mapping of, and, and you see this in a lot of different dimensions of the conflict. You see it in the you know, exceptional attention, I think, given what's going on on the ground to the dynamics of who's leaving Ukraine and how and why. Um, a projection of contemporary, largely American concerns onto a space rather than, you know, seeking out the full picture of the place as it is. As far as the deployment of symbols and their changing resonance, yes, I definitely think there'll be more attention, closer attention to these images that are being deployed. And um, uh, some of the images that you might find inspiring now have an ugly past and that will have to be dealt with. Um, I think that also closer attention is gonna be paid to things that nobody really thought about in the US, for example, before this week, like statements by dueling patriarchs, right? This patriarch versus that patriarch coming out with these, these opposing narratives of what this conflict is about. And I do think that this, this war is making visible certain lacuna in our understanding, for sure, and in the way that the Slavic world is studied and approached. And I, I think that that's um, certainly underway. Well, and to follow up, one of your Gogol students is asking if Gogol himself is being weaponized in this particular war <laughs> symbol. I haven't heard I haven't heard any Gogol memes or anything like that yet, but. <laughs> to me if they come your way. Can I just say that like we have some history between 2014 again and now. So and I don't know to which degree like people are aware, but even among uh, my mostly black Russian speaking Har Kharkiv, many of my relatives increasingly speak Ukrainian. They like my birthday card was in Ukrainian even though and I kind of now I'm picked up with all this news like I'm back to my Ukrainian not so being so rusty. But I like sometimes had to use Google Translate, but not, not anymore. But my point is that you already seen what happened to Russian language, not because, like, just because this, you know, you want to reinstate your identity and people did it of free will. Nobody made them. And yet, just yesterday, I watched this fame, you know, pretty famous TV personality. He's a doctor, like, who's listened to both, he's from Kharkiv, he's listened to in Russia and Ukraine, he's a very big audience of like pediatric advice show. And he said basically like nothing has done more to hurt Russian language in Ukraine than this war. Because that's the language he said I used to sing lullabies to my grandchildren. I'm not sure anybody would want to do that. You know, and that's pain, right? Which I think you alluded to. Like, yes, there's gonna be that backlash. And it's painful, but you know. Thank you all for coming out. This has been really informative. Um, my question is on the future geopol geopolitical situation. So supposing the defense holds in Ukraine and the Russian army is repelled, and maybe even Putin falls, whether or not, um, how does the international community interact and engage Russia to ensure that, you know, a 24 year old lieutenant in the <coughs> Russian military 30 years from now becomes Russian president? Let's say, hey, the fall of uh, our failure in Ukraine was the worst geopolitical, geopolitical <laughs> catastrophe in the 21st century as a pedestal to do another radical act. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I wish, I mean, I, mean I, I wish we knew the answer now and I wish we knew the answer like 1990, right? In 1991 when something similar was happening. So I guess the only thing I would say is let's draw some lessons what might have gone a little bit wrong then 
And there's certainly some sort of history of a very patronizing attitude that the West had towards Russia after the fallout of the Soviet Union. There was, I think there was enough space for a bit more constructive engagement with Russia at that moment in order not to sort of force these uh, revanchist moods that uh, a lot of uh, Russian leaders are uh, inspired by. So I think that's sort of one thing that I can say generically, not knowing what exactly will be the form and shape of Russian regime as it comes out. That's the only thing I could say. Um, as you mentioned, 2014, of course, the Minsk peace agreements were um, held during that time, and now we're having peace talks again in Minsk. Minsk. Um, do you feel like it's too little too late? Could you see an eventuality in which we do get some peace talks out of this? And what would that look like? Maybe the whole panel. So here's the scenario that I'm sort of fearing a lot. So in the end of the day, right, this will some, somehow the dust will have to settle. So it's not like taking over Aleppo or Grozny, right? They're like, they're just that the Russians are going to run out of ammunition at some point, that that will have to happen, right? And Ukrainian defense will get tired at some point, especially if, you know, if NATO or the West doesn't intervene. So there will have to be some, some form of settlement. I presume this form of settlement that will probably save Putin's space will be, well, let's take part of Ukraine to have the land bridge to, to Crimea, something like that. So, so much more than they, they would have gotten from, from the Minsk agreement, right? But here's the problem. I don't think a lot of people in Ukraine are going to sign up for that deal. And I'm sort of this scenario that they really fear is something like, let's say, similar to what happened uh, during the Irish independence war against Greece, right? Where, okay, the leadership signs an agreement because they know they cannot move further, but the more extreme flanks resist that agreement and you have something like a civil war breaking out. I'm not saying it will happen, but I sort of, within the scenarios that are possible, that's one that is really worrying me. Okay, so Professor Tucker, I think you mentioned like China's position in the UN. And so far, since have followed, they've mostly been abstaining from voting. So I'm just wondering if you have any more thoughts or thoughts. Sure. Yeah, no, I think this is this has been a huge question because there was a, a, a narrative before the invasion in the sort of lead up to this, when a lot of people thought this was just posturing, didn't renegotiate, things like that that Putin would not be vulnerable to sanctions and that they had spent the last eight years learning the lessons from Crimea and they had fortified their economy against those sanctions. And there were two reasons that that was supposedly not the case. The first was they had all these hard currency reserves. And that's because nobody thought that all their assets overseas were gonna be, be frozen. And, that is, and they don't have the money to intervene to prop up the ruble. And, and, there's a whole other, and then there's all sorts of issues about settling contracts and buying goods and things like that. The second was that China was going to support them. And that's the interesting question, because clearly there is one story you can tell where China is the rising power uh, at trying to challenge American hegemony in the world, or American or NATO, whatever you want to call it, and that it's good for China to have Russia on their side pushing back against American hegemony. And so China is going to support Russia and make it harder for the West to use these economic sanctions as a lever by, by picking up the slack and buying goods and all those sorts of things. So that's one particular sort of take on it. Another take on it though, is that in 2014, when China picked up the slack from Crimea by buying energy from Russia, they did it at very, very advantageous terms to China, right? Not to Russia at that particular point of time. And China, if we go from the thing that Artaris and I have been saying a lot here, autocrats want to remain in power. They, they need the support of their population. China has a billion people, right? And is very much dependent on a growth led and a growth model for maintaining the position of the Communist Party in power and is heavily, heavily intertwined in Western economies. And so China, I think also at the same time, kind of needs to be careful about what it does that might put it and put some of its companies and banks and stuff like that on the wrong side of these, of these particular sanctions. And so what you're seeing that's interesting is that there was this kind of fascinating article in the New York Times this morning about RT, which is China, the Russian state propaganda. It's the same Russian state propaganda that like Facebook kicked off and, and, and now Russia has shut down Facebook. And like 
but that apparently, according to this investigation from the Times, and we're doing some stuff at the Center for Social Media and Politics with RT, looking at who is kind of picking up narratives from RT, but we haven't been looking at China. The Times claims there's just a ton of like picking up narratives from RT and actually inserting them into Chinese uh, state publications and inserting them into Chinese social media. So there's one sort of like, you can look cursorily and see, okay, is the China, are the Chinese in their sort of media on social media, on Chinese social media, on, we on Weibo, on WeChat, you know, is there like pro-Russian narratives being reported? And there's lots of, but the question is, the longer this draws out, how much of trade with the West is China willing to risk over this, right? How much is China willing to spend of its own money to sort of prop Russia up? And I think the abstain vote is kind of interesting because it says they didn't come in and veto the resolution in the Security Council, which they could have done. And China's in a weird situation because China's, first of all, China has dealings with Ukraine because of the Silk Road Initiative. And, you know, like China has investments in Ukraine, China has investments in most places. But secondly, China has long pushed sovereignty, right? As the major sort of thing that people, and this has been their criticism of the West, that they should respect sovereignty, that you do not tell people what to do inside their own borders. And this is their, they don't like the hubris of the West for telling people of preaching democracy and regime change and all those sorts of things. China does not see Taiwan as a sovereign country. China sees Taiwan as a separate, as a part of China. And therefore, if the Russians maybe were counting on that China would see Russia's relationship with Ukraine the same as China sees its relationship with Taiwan or its relationship with Hong Kong, you know, maybe a little bit of that. But on the other hand, this has long been China's mantra about sovereignty. And what the Russians are clearly doing here is not respecting Ukrainian sovereignty. So there's a lot of different moving pieces here um, about this. And I think people will be watching very much to see what China does. I mean, the betting money right now is that if push comes to shove, China would rather maintain its trade with the West than it would prop up a potential ally in the global international struggle against the West for sort of longer term strategic reasons and take, you know, and risk shorter term hits around economics. I'm not a China expert by any stretch of the imagination. I've just been listening to a lot of people talking about this. Josh, if I could just jump in for a second. That mantra about um, sovereignty, Russia used to give the same mantra, right? <laughs> um, they also used to emphasize sovereignty intensely. And now, of course, they've well, not not backtracked on it. I think this is where a lot of the sovereignty for certain states right, right. It is a vision of a multipolar, bipolar, polar, at any rate, the poles are the places that get sovereignty. I think what Russia is trying to see Ukraine the way China is seeing Taiwan, right? Right. And the difference is, is that China recognized Ukraine yeah. as an independent name. I mean, China, Ukraine's been around for 30 years now at this point. So I think that that's probably... Can I, can, I, sorry, can I ask a follow-up question to that? And especially like to the argument you made that at some point the resources to rearm will run out on the Russian side and the Ukrainian side and everybody would be uh, willing to sign some agreements with people. If the resources to rearm will run out on the Russian side and China does not come in to provide them and NATO still provides them on the Ukrainian side, would that not lead to a settlement you just outlined? Yeah, except that they have nukes, right? So, but I think like part of this whole discussion is right. If we put nukes back into the equation, we can't even have any of this right. conversation. Right. And if we take nukes out, then there is a question of non-nuclear conflict in which Russia would be cut off from replenishing its supplies unless China comes in, and Ukraine should still have support from the civilized West. Wouldn't that? So, and I, I think what's what's very interesting about this war. Like if, if there were no nukes, right, in this war, what have we seen is that it was supposed to be the second strongest army in the world, right? And it's really, really struggling. Like, we might debate whether this was what Russia planned or not. It's pretty clear that it's actually struggling. It's pretty hard to deny this fact. So if Russia didn't have nukes, this would be such a major fallout right now for Russia to basically show to the entire world publicly that's pretty much what we can do, right? So, so nukes is really the only thing that is that is saving its face right now. That's my view. So if we, we, we could take nuclear weapons out of the equation, I think this would end up very, very differently right now. I feel like a lot of our discussion was based on the premise that we can't, because otherwise there is nothing to discuss. 
like if, it's either there is something to discuss about all the strategy and potential exits and all that, or there is nothing to discuss. Because if Russia loses space with Ukraine, it's only option, given it's a democratic regime and Putin's self preservation is to use a tactical nuclear end of story. This whole discussion. Is so I, if we take nukes out, then there is like potential for discussion. Well, on that apocalyptic note, <laughs> we've gone over, we plan to, to allow ourselves to go over, but we really, I think, are pretty much out of time at this point. Um, but I encourage you all to um, follow the Jordan Center on Twitter, check out um, the Jordan Center website, subscribe to its uh, newsletters, check out um, ACES.org for resources about Ukraine, and rest assured that there will be other uh, events about uh, this conflict and about Russia and Ukraine in general. Um, over the coming weeks. And thank you all for coming. And I want to thank the students for excellent questions. This has been really great. Thank you.